It always helps if you turn it on. <laughs> it really is. It's good to be here this morning. I, I feel at peace being in the Lord's house. I hope that you're blessed this morning as well. Um, today, the message is entitled, Redeeming the Time. And hopefully we're able to have it up here in just a moment. I'm not hooked up. Oh, you're right. That's why I have these guys, to point out the obvious. All right, let's see. There we go. Bear with me for just a moment, folks, and we should be ready to go. I'm going to have to reboot it or restart the presentation anyway. There we are. I beg your pardon. Now let's have prayer, shall we? Our Father, we thank you this morning that we can be here together. We pray now that as we look into your word and we consider what it is that you would say to us, that you would help us to have teachable spirits. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So today's message is entitled, Redeeming the Time, and basically, you notice I have a little uh, subtitle there, Living Like It Matters, and that's really what I want to get to today. We, we need to live our life as though how we are living each day matters, because it does. Okay, um, actually, I, I would like to start out just by talking to you a little bit about time. Okay, so time is the most precious commodity that you and I have. It is by far the most important thing that you and I are stewards over, is our time. It is irreplaceable. And you notice that quote up here, it says, time is like a river. You cannot touch the same water twice because the flow that has passed will never pass again. If, so if you're standing at a river and, and you're touching some water as, you're, as the river's flowing by, you're never going to touch that same water again. It's gone by, right? This is how time is. Time continues to move by. You never have this moment again, which, <clears throat> by the way, I might point out that I praise the Lord that we all made the decision to come here and gather and worship this morning and make this use of our time. This is a good investment to be together with like-minded believers, to hear the proclamation of the Lord, and then to be encouraged in your faith. All right, so <clears throat> continue on talking about time. Time uh, is the most valuable thing that a man can spend. It's not your money, it's, it's time. So how do we spend it? You know, we talked about the fact that some of us, I mean, we, all of us are here, I hope, um, who are here. <laughs> uh, and also, you know, how else do we spend our time? There's lots of ways that we spend time these days. And each time a minute goes by, that is something that is gone. That time will not come back. It was used in one way or another. Or squandered right so i want to point out this uh quote here it says he lives long who lives well and time misspent is not lived but lost time misspent is not lived but lost that's an important thing to consider how do we waste our time TV, definitely that's one way. Sometimes with mindless things that are on the TV too or, or 
corrupted things, right? If we're honest. And, you know, people play a lot of games these days. There's a lot of gamers. I'm not saying that it's always wrong to watch something on the television or that there's never a time where friends can't get together and play a game. That's not what I am saying. What I am saying is that we are stewards of our time and how we are using our time is very, very important. And if we are just giving lots of time to things like television or, you know, Facebook or, or um, gaming or how about this one? Arguing. There's so many ways that time just gets away from you. Have you ever had a, a, a time where, you know, you had a certain amount of time to be with this person, and instead of, instead of having a, a great time together, the, you argued? Uh, and then you lost that time, and it was just gone, right? What a waste. So here's the thing. You know, we need to respect the fact that God has given us time, amen? And not just on the Sabbath day. And I'm glad that God has given us the Sabbath day. What a gift, amen? He, you know, to pull us apart from our busyness and the regular common things that occupy our, our time. Now, on the Sabbath, he's given us a special place in time to come apart from all of that and really be engaged with him and his people and in creation and have an experience with him. And I, I praise him for that. Now, I believe that God is trying to get us to understand something about time. Um, have you ever been woke up where somebody's, you know, you, you slept too long for something and somebody wakes you up and they say, don't you know what time it is? And all of a sudden, when you realize what time it is, it's, it's like alarming to you, and you got to get up and get moving. Did that ever happen with you? Okay, good. That's not unique to my experience. All right. Well, I want to take a look into Scripture here. We're going to start in the book of Romans. And in Romans, we're going to look at verses 13 through 11. Romans 13 through 11. So, excuse me. Romans 13, 11 through 14. So I'll get it right. When you get to Romans 13, 11, would you just say amen? amen? Very good. All right, I'm going to begin reading then. It says, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. It is high time to awake out of sleep. Friends, I don't know, when it, whenever I read this, I think back to the time when, when I really first gave my heart to Jesus. And I think about how urgent I felt about being ready for Jesus' return. How important it was that I share my faith and that other people get ready too. And now it says our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And the night is far spent. And the day is at hand. And I'm going to tell you, some people have been coming to this church for a good many years. We've heard lots of sermons. We've engaged in lots of activities, outreaches. We've studied a lot of Sabbath school lessons. We have heard the Lord speak to us, amen? And God, all this time, has been gifting us 
with time. Time for us to surrender everything to him. Time for us to heed his word, not just as students who can quote it in a timely manner, but no, people who will live by the things that we know the Lord is saying. It is time for us to live like it matters. Because it does. I guess before we move ahead, I, I'm going to go ahead and read Ephesians chapter 5. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 5. If you're there, would you say amen? Very good. We're going to be reading verses 14 through 16. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 14. And it says, therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now listen, <clears throat> is it possible that people who are actually church-going folk could be spiritually dead? It is. Is it possible that people who are very involved church-going folk, very religious and systematic in their giving and all of that, are, could be spiritually dead? It is possible. So all I'm saying is that God is saying to us, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk, how? Circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. Notice what it says in verse 16. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Redeeming the time. So we're supposed to walk circumspectly, and we are supposed to redeem the time because the days are evil. Okay. This, what you see on the screen there, it says, exagorazo. This is a Greek word that is, was used in the New Testament right here where it says redeeming. And it means to buy up or to ransom, or to rescue from loss. And what is it saying that we should buy up, that we should ransom, that we should rescue from loss? What did Scripture say? Redeeming the time. We should be rescuing our time from loss. We should be rescuing our time. We should be buying it up, acting like our time is valuable, because guess what? It is. Because the days are evil. That's why we're to redeem the time. Because the days are evil. Do you recognize, friends, you've been hearing a last day message preached from this church long before I got here. In these past four plus years that I've been preaching here, you've been hearing a last day message about God's people needing to get ready. And I'm just saying, the day of our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. And it is time for us to redeem the time. We've got to live like it matters. Turn with me to Colossians. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 5 and 6. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. If you're there, say amen. Very good. It says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Hmm, there it is again. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Listen, here's the thing. Last time it spoke about us redeeming the time, it made reference to the days being evil, right? Here it's speaking about redeeming the time, and it's saying so that we can walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. 
do you realize we need to make sure that we are not losing our opportunity to minister to people who don't yet know the things that you know about Jesus, who don't yet have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It makes a difference how we are with people. Do you realize that it, it even matters? It, it, in verse 6, it says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. So if we're impatient with people, if we think somebody's an idiot because they're doing something, you better pray the prayer, Lord, put a gate over my mouth. Right? Because we need to be speaking in grace toward people Especially in these last days, friends. You don't know what your word may do to lift someone up, to impart a word of knowledge, or to actually bring somebody down. Who wants to be a part of bringing somebody down, belittling them, you know, discouraging them in their walk? Nobody wants that, right? And yet, I, I dare say, at times, all of us have been guilty of such. So it's time for us to redeem the time and make sure that our communication, particularly with those outside, is of a gracious nature. And seasoned with salt, what would that mean? Hmm? Flavorful, okay. It, it's appealing. You are the salt of the earth, aren't you? Do you know that when salt comes into contact with something, it always changes that something? It flavors it. It tenderizes it. It makes a difference. And you are salt and light. Now, let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. If you're there, could you say amen? Very good. I want to just take a look at verses 1 and 2. It says here, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. I want to stop right there just for a second. Paul is saying, please don't receive the grace of God. How? In vain. What does that in vain mean again? What does that mean? If it's in vain, it didn't really count, right? It was futile. It made no difference. So don't receive the grace of God in vain. Listen, right now, right now, friends, today, this very minute, you are living under grace. Do you know that? This very moment, do not receive the grace of God in vain. Accept his grace and be thankful and show your gratitude in the way that you live. Let's see, second verse. For he says, in an, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Did you realize that we started out by talking about the fact that we are to redeem the time because the days are evil? Now we're being told that now is the day of salvation. Friends, we, are not, we do not have the luxury of some kind of a delay for us to just kind of be self-indulgent and distracted. It is time for us to focus on God and give Him our attention. Give Him our time. I want to ask you a question. I'm not looking for you to raise your hand. But I want to ask you, if you were to compare, you know, one of your favorite hobbies. I don't know what your hobby is, whether it's watching football, doing something on a computer, playing a sport. I, I have no idea what your 
favorite hobby is. But if you were to compare how much time you invest in your hobby and how much time you invest in personal devotion to God, praying and talking to him, letting him speak to you through his word, how do they compare? What gets more of your time and attention? I'm telling you, right now, I believe that God is asking us to reprioritize our lives, to take a good hard look. Actually, can you imagine if you were to just say to God, basically, here's, here's my life, God. I, I want to give you permission to show me what things I need to cut out what things I need to reel in, what things you would like me to add in. And I just want to give you permission, God, to restructure my life. Does that sound like a good idea? Amen. So, I want to tell you a little story. I used to work at a, a major restaurant in the Flint area in Michigan. <clears throat> it was Bosley's restaurant. And I was the purchasing agent, the stock person, inventory, all of that was my stuff. And so, anyway, I, I had very close hands-on with everything that came into the restaurant that was a food or drink item or whatever. And so anyhow, one day, the boss came in stressed out, and he said, get into the cooler. You got to clean it up. We had six walk-in coolers. We had uh, four walk-in freezers. This was a big operation, right? Um, and so he's saying, get in there and clean them up. The health inspector's at the front door. So, you know, that time we were caught unaware. And I, I have to say that even though a lot of things were as they should be, there were some things that were not as they should be. And we got a poor write-up. Guess what? That poor write-up made it into the newspaper. That hurt for a little while. We rebounded. We were the premier property in the area. Uh, but anyhow, we re re rebounded because we started to take the approach of instead of trying to get ready when we think the health inspector might be coming, we just need to always operate so that we are ready. We just need to be ready. If he comes by, that's fine. We're ready. Okay? So that's how we started to operate things so that everything was labeled, everything was stored as it should be, all the things that were out and exposed to the air were the right temperature, all that kind of thing. We just started operating the way that we needed to. And then the next time the health inspector came through, we got an A-plus rating, and that went in the paper. So that was good. Um, but the bottom line that I'm saying with all of this, this is just a simple analogy to say that you know, you and I, we need to be ready, friends. We, we can't think of, you know, oh, is it almost time? Do, do you think Jesus might come back? Well, how much more time do we got? Can we keep doing what we've been doing? Friends, we just need to be ready. Don't you think? We just need to be ready. Let's look at Mark. Mark chapter 13. And by the way, um, many of you have realized that, uh, you know, sometimes people die untimely deaths, don't they? And it just seems like, man, they had their whole life in front of them. It seemed like such a strange time for someone to die. But, you know, the reality is you and I, we don't know the future 
But the, the thing is, like my mom always used to say, we know who holds the future, so we just need to put ourselves in, in, in his hands. Right? So let's look at Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 13, and we'll read verses 32 through 37. And Jesus is speaking here, and he says, But of that day and hour, no one knows. What day and hour is he speaking of? The hour of his coming, his return, right? Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly, he finds you what? Sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Who is speaking again? Jesus is speaking here. Does that sound like a warning to you? Sounds like a warning to me. Be on watch because you don't know when the time is coming. You have to be prepared for when the time comes. John F. Kennedy said that we must use our time as a tool, not as a couch. That makes sense, doesn't it? Use our time as a tool, time to be industrious and take care of things that matter. Instead of just time to be leisure. Now listen, I realize, and please don't take me wrong, I don't think that you should, you know, be in church 24-7 or that you should always work and never rest. That's, that's not how God designed things. There's a rest day built into every week, right? What I am saying is we need to pay attention to the times in which we're living. And then, since we are living in such times, we need to redeem the time. We need to ransom it as though we need to buy it up. We've got to save it from being lost because the hours, we're, we're so much nearer to the return of Jesus than when we first believed. So it would be ridiculous for us to become lackadaisical or to stay in a complacent type of an approach to life and ministry. It would be a bad mistake. Now, I have one more thing that I'm going to share with you. This is a quote um, that I'm, I'm just going to read this to you. This is actually a, from my life today, and it's a day's devotional. And I just want you to listen to how it speaks about time. It's entitled, The, the Talent of Time. So it's, it cites the scripture that we've already been over. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Okay, now we go on and talk about it. God bestows talents upon men. Not that these talents may lie unused or be employed in self-gratification, but that they may be used to bless others. Did you catch that? Right? God grants men the gift of time for the purpose of promoting His glory. When this time is used in selfish pleasure... The hours thus spent are lost for all eternity. I want to pause just to say this. When I think back on my life before I gave it to Christ, it's, it's very, I, I just, I have repented to him about all the years that I wasted that belonged to him. Just wasted years. And now I hope to redeem the time 
in these days that I have left that he's been blessing me with. Our time belongs to God. Every moment is his. And we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to his glory. Of no talent he has given will he require a more strict account than of our time. The value of time is beyond computation. Christ regarded every moment as precious, and it is thus that we should regard it. Life is too short to be trifled away. We have but a few days of probation in which to prepare for eternity. The human family have scarcely begun to live when they begin to die. And the world's incessant labor ends in nothingness unless a true knowledge and regard to eternal life is gained. The man who appreciates time as his working day will fit himself for a mansion and for a life that is immortal. It is well that he was born. Life is too solemn to be absorbed in temporal and earthly matters in a treadmill of care and anxiety for the things that are, but an atom in comparison with the things of eternal interest. I want to pause just right there. You know, we get absorbed in temporal things, right? We do. Things that are just, they only matter right now. They're not even going to matter in the big picture. But we get absorbed in these things, and these things are like an atom, like, like an atom when you compare it to all eternity. Yet God has called us to serve him in the temporal affairs of life. Diligence in this work is as much a part of true religion as is devotion. The Bible gives us no endorsement to idleness. It is the greatest curse that afflicts our world. Every man and woman who is truly converted will be a diligent worker. How many? Everyone. Everyone who is truly converted will be a diligent worker. Wow. Notice at the very bottom, the moments are freighted with eternal consequences. Freighted, what's that word mean? Loaded. Loaded, yeah. Like a freight train, right? The moments are freighted with eternal consequences. So if you just do something that's just, uh, you know, I really don't want to do anything and you're just frittering away your time, I just want you to realize that that is actually God's time that he has entrusted to you as a steward. Right? Man, why so serious, Pastor? Sucking the fun right out of my plans. Listen, why am I so serious? Because we must redeem the time. Because the days are evil. We have to take and make the best use of what we have left. By entirely committing ourselves, our energies, our focus to God and his work. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Right? Amen. Hey, if you think, you know, I realize I need a little work here. I, I need God to help me with prioritizing my time so that I am a better steward of it and that I'm ready for his return. If, I just, I really need that. If, you, if that's you, just raise your hand. Amen. Well, then I'd like to pray for us. Father, just now, we thank you that you've afforded us this time to come together. This special Sabbath hour. We know that you have been here with us as We've looked into your word and considered your exhortations to your people. I pray, Father, that we would be wise and that we will heed your warning. That we will 
redeem the time that you've given to us and we won't let it be lost and squandered away. I pray, Father, that you will help us to live like it matters today and each day forward. And we need your help with this, Lord. We need you to show us where, you know, there are things that we need to cut out of our lives that are consuming too much time. We need to have you reveal to us what we need to incorporate into our lives because it's a priority. I pray that you will give us wisdom and that you will help us as a people to grow, Lord, to be in a state of readiness, not trying to scramble to get ready at the last minute, but living life in such a way that we're ready when you come. I pray for this blessing, Lord, in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now we will sing our closing song together. Let's all stand. 216. When the roll is called up yonder. Hey, I want to close with, with this thought. Um, when I was in seminary, I had this professor who said, you know, when we started out the year, he said, your quizzes, the quizzes in this class are going to count for more than 50% of your grade. And the quiz will be given first thing the moment the bell rings. If you are not seated... When the bell rings, the door is closed and locked, and you do not get to take the quiz. And so it became very, very important to be punctual, to be on time, to make good use of your time in the morning so that you showed up because it counted. It mattered. And brothers and sisters, when the roll is called up yonder, we want to be there, right? We want to be there. Let's make good use of our time. Father, once again, we come to you in prayer. We ask for your blessing. Help us to be wise as stewards with the most precious commodity entrusted to us, the time that you have given to us. I pray, Lord, that we would seize the day. Father, that we would improve upon our opportunities. 
and that each one of us would grow in faith and love as time goes by. Bless us to this end, I pray in Jesus' holy name.